into St Mark's Church for this service of morning prayer for the third Sunday in Lent. James is running up to the altar, so maybe something needs adjusting. So a sentence from scripture, from the psalm that we will be saying together later in the service. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We start with the greeting. Praise the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. Lord, open our lips, and we shall praise your name. We come to confess our sins. We meet in the presence of God, who knows our needs, hears our cries, feels our pain, and heals our wounds. In a moment of quiet, let us bring to mind our sins and failings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our sins in penitence and faith. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to know your Son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. So when the Almighty and Merciful Lord has pardoned 
and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we join together in saying the psalm pointed for today, Psalm number 19. Please join in with the verses in bold. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. The comment to special prayer for today, the third Sunday in Lent. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we have our Bible reading, after which we keep just a moment of quiet. The reading is taken from John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple court, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all up from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, 
It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. It's been a long time since we've been able to sing together in church. I've missed that aspect of our services, and I look forward to the day when singing will once again be allowed. But they say that every cloud has a silver lining, and one positive outcome of not being allowed to sing is that we've made much more use of the psalms in our worship. I hope this is something that will continue, because Psalms are important, so important that the Book of Common Prayer provides not all 150 of them to be heard in services every month. I don't think that can be said for any other book of the Bible. But if the Psalms are so important, why do we so rarely hear them preach about? Well, there's no good answer to that question, so today, as I've done on a couple of occasions in the past, I'll try to go a little way to putting that right. The Psalms weren't all written by the same person or at the same time. A good number seem to have dated from around 1060 to 1000 BC, which more or less coincides with the lifetime of King David. But others were probably written as late as 440 BC. And Psalm 88, which could refer to the Israelites' sufferings in Egypt, may have been written as early as 1550 BC. The reasons that they are grouped together as a book of the Bible are the poetry which they all contain, and more importantly, a dominant theme of trust in God and the belief that when we trust and pray, God will respond. The 150 Psalms are, can be divided into subgroups in various ways, and one of these ways identifies a group called Genesis Psalms. Like the book of Genesis in the Bible, they deal with creation, with God's blessing of that creation. They deal with humanity's fall into sin, and they deal with God's redemption of humanity from that sin. Psalm 19, which we said together a few minutes ago, is one of these Genesis Psalms. Well, that's enough by way of background. Why do we use Psalm 19 as one of our Bible readings on this first Sunday of Lent? The answer is, I think, that Lent is a time when Christian people traditionally make a special effort to learn more about God and to draw closer to him as they prepare to welcome the risen Lord during the joyous celebrations of Easter. And Psalm 19 reminds us, challenges us even, to learn more about God and draw closer to him in a range of different ways. The middle part of Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, and, and do look at it on your order of service if you like, verses 7 to 11, speak of scripture. Of course, much less scripture existed when the psalm was written than exists today, and so the focus is on God's laws and commands. But the point made by this part of the psalm, that scripture is precious, and that we should allow it to guide our lives, is just as valid and relevant today. The final part of Psalm 19, verses 12 to 14, 
speaks of prayer. It speaks particularly of a desire to be kept free from sin, of the need to be forgiven for sins which are committed, and, in verse 14, of a wish to speak and think and pray in ways which are pleasing to God. Scripture and prayer, and I've no doubt that many of you, many of us, will be studying Scripture and engaging in prayer this Lent as we seek to learn more about God and to draw closer to Him. And this is right, and it's proper, and it's good. But what about the first part of Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6? They speak of creation, not just the creation of humanity, or even the creation of this world, but the creation of the entire universe. They speak of God as the creator of the entire universe. And they speak of the universe declaring that he is its creator. Verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Is this an aspect of God that we ignore as we seek to learn more about him and to draw closer to him during Lent? Perhaps you don't ignore it, and that's wonderful. But I've never taken part in a Lent study course which is asking you to go outside and look at the hills or at the stars and to marvel and to give thanks. If, in our attempts to learn more about God, we ignore his role as creator, then we must ask why. It may be simple forgetfulness. But it may also be that we are swayed by developments in science to question the role of God as creator of all things. If science can explain creation and evolution, then does God really have a part to play? In answer to that question, I offer these words. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. These are not my words. They are the words of Sir Isaac Newton, and I believe he knew a thing or two about science. Newton acknowledged God as creator of the universe. He saw science not as challenging the role of God as creator, but as explaining that role. It's a view of science that I am inclined to share. So, in what remains of Lent and four weeks do still remain, do try to learn more about the God who loves us by reading and studying scripture and through prayer and meditation. That's important. But I encourage you also to make time to look and marvel at creation, at the world around you, and on a clear night, at the stars above you. And as you do so, try to understand more about God the Creator by reflecting on the fact that the loving God, who is able to know and care about each individual one of us, is also the awesome God whose artistry created all that has been, all that is, and all that ever will be. Let us confirm our belief in that God as we enjoy together from the order of service in the words of the Apostles' Creed. So let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Turn to our time for prayer. In our intercessions this morning, we continue to think of God as creator of ourselves, of our world, and of the universe. When I say we declare, please respond, all creation belongs to you. So we declare all creation belongs to you. Creator God, we believe that you are the creator of the universe. We believe that you are the ruler and owner of all you have created. We believe that you love all that you have created. We declare all creation belongs to you. Creator God, we give thanks for creation's awesome beauty and its bountiful provision. We declare, all creation belongs to you. Creator God, we give thanks for the many ways in which creation reveals your glory and draws us closer to you. We declare, all creation belongs to you. Creator God, we acknowledge that our world is broken and scarred by war, by misuse of resources, by greed, and by the inequality which is a consequence of greed. And we confess that we have contributed to this. For the sake of our children and grandchildren, and of generations yet to come, we recommit ourselves to caring for that which you have created for us. As we declare, all creation belongs to you. Creator God, we pray for our political leaders as they work to find answers to the world's problems. May their goal be justice and equity rather than political posturing. May they seek consensus over controversy and action over apathy. And may they hear us as we declare all creation belongs to you. Creator God, we take a moment to remember those whom you have created who are currently suffering as individuals, especially those whom we know and love, and whom we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts now. And I ask you to pray for Isabel Nicastar. May they know that they are loved by us and also by you, as they are part of creation, and we declare all creation belongs to you. Finally, Creator God, we pray for those who have departed this life and who are now part of your greater heavenly creation. We pray especially for those loved by us and from our Book of Remembrance this month. Evelyn Bunting, Bernard Hawke, Susan Crawshaw, Isabel Moss, 
Luna Fred Lewis, Nelly Barnett, Charles Richardson, Anne Davenport, Pauline Stocker, Catherine Webb, Henry Cox, Joe Mappin, Reginald Bowler, and Cora Sharp, Mayor Beaver, Alice Gregory, Brenda Pover, Percy Kay, Jean Stocks, Dorothy Weatherall, Dora Rayner, William Boswell, Arthur Rayner, Olive Wright, Percy Gill, Charlotte Round, George Martin, Phyllis Burley, Ernest Senior, Pearl Kay. May they remain in your love. Creator God, you have filled the universe with beauty. Open our eyes, we pray, to see your gracious hand in all your works, so that, rejoicing in the whole of your creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. This we ask for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. And we draw together our prayers by joining together in the Lord's Prayer. So, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For our hymn this morning that we're going to listen to together, I have chosen one that may be unfamiliar to some, to many of you, even though it's a, a very old hymn. The language of Italy is archaic. Some of the scientific references to the orbits of the stars and the planets are perhaps um, a little bit wide of the mark. But particularly in the third verse, I think it's a wonderful account of how all creation praises the God who created it. Um, the hymn is sung by the choir of Trinity College, Cambridge. It is based on the first few verses of Psalm 19, and it's a spacious firmament on a high. <laughs>
to the end of our service this morning, but I did promise I would give you the details of how to contact us if you wish to let us know that you'd like to attend church on Easter Sunday if we're able to hold a service. So please do it either by emailing the St. Mark's account at St. Mark's Grenoside, that's ST, but no punctuation, St. Mark's Grenoside at gmail.com or by text to 07958 514611. So St. Mark's Grenoside at gmail.com or 07958 514611. And if you're inspired to listen to more music proclaiming God as Creator, I can suggest nothing better than the chorus The Heavens Are Telling from The Creation by Joseph Hyde. Look it up on the internet. So, from the final page of the Order of Service, we say together the closing prayer. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless us and watch over us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look kindly on us and give us peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.